Steve. Got some news to share with you if you're a guest here and, or if you haven't been here for a while. We just recently started a staffed free nursery for kids three years old and under if this would be a good time to take them there. If not, if you want them with you, great. But if you need some time alone to listen, I understand that too. Staff, the, um, those workers in the nursery have been background checked, and so it's free to you, so I want you to know it's in room 104. If you go through the double doors and then through the single door, just there on your left, room 104, there is a, a monitor in there that's it's on with the, the service in there as well. So you can stay in there with them if you'd like, but staffed free nursery here at Peace. Yay! So thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Some years ago, the London Transit Authority was receiving a lot of complaints from customers. Their buses were actually driving past customers who were waiting at bus stops. The Transit Authority then put an explanation in the newspaper, and what I'm told, it's become infamous, and public relations departments now use the London Trans uh, Transit Authority's explanation in the newspaper as what not to do is what not to say. So here's what they put in the newspaper. The explanation said, it is impossible for us to maintain our schedule if we're always having to stop and pick up passengers. <laughs> At first when I read that, I think that has to be a joke. Well, how can we keep our schedule if we have to pick up passengers? I just think that's hilarious. The transit authority clearly had forgotten their purpose was transporting passengers. It wasn't keeping the main thing the main thing. I remember one day when I was in sales and uh, living in Portland, Oregon, I just was in the office. I wasn't around customers, but I was in the office, and I remember complaining. I was, I was complaining about some customer problems that I was having, and an older service manager, I was in sales, service managers, we shared an office, a service manager overheard what I was saying, and he, he came over and he gently kind of was helping to um, correct me with this joke. He said, you know, Neil, you're right, this job would be great if it weren't for the customers, you know? <laughs> and touche, right? His point got across that my job, was having and keeping satisfied customers who wanted to continue to buy from us. That was the main thing, customers. I'm told that of the 5,000 new businesses that start every year, only 1,000 are still around after two years. And then, after five years, only 200 of those 5,000 are still left. Consultants tell us the reason why that is. The common denominator with all those failed businesses is this. They have no clear purpose. They have no per clear goal or direction. They have, kept, they have not kept the main thing, the main thing. For I delivered to you as of first importance, first importance, the great missionary Paul was saying the same thing. Look, I kept the main thing, the main thing. Now, Corinthians, you do the same. This was in A.D. 55, and Paul was in Ephesus, Turkey. It was called Asia Minor at the time. There you see it, Ephesus there. But he was writing the letter to the Christians at Corinth, Greece. Paul had founded the church in Corinth in A.D. 50, only five years earlier. Now, ah, in Ephesus, he's hearing some really bad reports about the church at Corinth. It's only been five years since their founding and already these problems. There were divisions in the church. There were arguments about food, arguments about marriage and sexuality, about the resurrection of the dead, worship. <sighs> worship had totally gotten out of hand. Communion was all messed up. There were problems around the issues of speaking in tongues and prophecies. It was just a mess in Corinth, the church there. So Paul writes them a letter. And I tell you what, he doesn't hold back. It's a stinging letter. He sets him straight on all those different issues. Now, he's not trying to be mean. He's actually commenting because he cares. He's not telling them to be ashamed, but he's admonishing them, as a good pastor does. A good pastor gives a lot of gospel and love and mercy and grace and all those things, but there can come a time when he has to with the congregation, when they're not keeping the main thing the main thing, a good pastor comes and say, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. What's the main thing? Back on to the track we go. Because out of love, 
Paul was saying this. Now, comments, Paul comments on every problem in Corinth, but then he writes this so that they keep the main thing the main thing. Would you please read this out loud with me? I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you, for I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve going on. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Normally on Sundays, we, on a non-communion Sunday, we will um, recite one of the most ancient Christian creeds there is. Actually, it is the most ancient creed we have. It's the Apostles' Creed, and it's been dated to be around 100 AD. You'll notice in the Apostles' Creed, the heart of the Apostles' Creed also focuses on that very main thing of first importance. And in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day, he rose from the dead. You know, there are some churches that say, well, we never say anything but creeds. We don't say creeds because we just follow the Bible. And I'm like, well, <laughs> the creeds are put there by the church it's, it's a summary of what the Bible says. So whenever a church can kind of start to go off the, the track, the creeds kind of help us get back, say, wait, 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 wait. What's the basics of the faith? What does the Bible say? So I thank God for the creeds. Now look, I want to make sure you know something. Not all of the things that were going on in the Corinthian church were bad. In fact, in and of themselves, some of them were fine things. Like, should we want to know, should we eat food that's been sacrificed to idols? I mean, should we circumcise our sons? Or should we speak in tongues? What about the role of women in the church? They weren't all bad things, so don't get me wrong. But you see, what was going on was their focus overall in the church was on the minor side things, not on keeping the main thing the main thing. And there were some false teachers in Corinth coming in to use those things to take them off track. The main thing, you might be thinking, okay, just tell us. What's the main thing? The main thing is this. Jesus Christ died to pay the penalty of death for your sins. Jesus Christ was really buried. Jesus Christ really rose from the grave. He really showed himself to hundreds of people so that he had a whole bunch of eyewitnesses to the resurrected Christ. Jesus Christ and his life and his death and his resurrection should always be the main thing in the church of Jesus Christ. And as long as I am pastor of Peace Lutheran Church, Jesus Christ, the person and work of Jesus Christ, will always remain the main thing. It was the final hole of the 1961 Masters Tournament. Final hole. Arnold Palmer had one stroke lead in this final hole, and he had just shot a great tee shot. As he approached the ball, he saw an old friend standing off there, kind of edge of the gallery, and the friend motioned him over and stuck out his head and said, congratulations, Arnold, and Arnold went over there and shook his friend's hand. But as soon as he did, he realized he had lost his focus. On his next two shots, he hit the ball into the sand trap, and then he put the, one, the next one over the, edge, over the edge of the green. And then he missed a putt and lost the Masters. Later on, Palmer said that he would never again like that lose his focus. I'm going to ask you this question, and be honest with yourself and with me. Rhetorically, we can talk later. <laughs> you know, if you want to say it now, I guess, but um, in what ways could peace be losing our focus, or at least flirting with losing our focus, taking our eyes off of Jesus? Are we keeping the main thing the main thing. Look, just like the Corinthians, there are these minor things that are not necessarily sinful or bad. They can actually be good and godly unless they can begin to overshadow Jesus and the good news. And I gotta tell you, in the 12 years I've been here, there have been times when we have not only flirted with 
not keeping the main things and main things. We've actually gone that route. I praise God in his wisdom, in his providence, in his rebuke, in his conviction. He has brought us back. And they're little things. Don't get me wrong. It's not like we stop saying that Jesus was risen from the grave. I'm not saying that. But just little things that take our eyes off the focus. Jesus, his word, his great commission to make disciples, to seek and save the lost, to remember that apart from Jesus Christ, our friends will go to hell for eternity. Sometimes I think we forget that. There are people in, yes, even Waverly, Nebraska, who do not trust in Jesus Christ for the salvation, for the forgiveness of their sins. And if they die in that state, they will spend forever in eternity. And brothers and sisters, it's up to you and me. God wants to work through us to bring the message of Jesus to them. And if we get off track and worry about side things, then God will work through other people. For such a time as this, though, hasn't he brought us into this space, into this time, into this community for, uh, for him to work through us so that he might save them. This is what happens when we lose what is of first importance. But I praise God that he continually brings us back as we confess. Now I'm gonna ask the same thing of you as an individual child of God. I know, I get it. You've got tons of things in your life. I get that. Work, school, Kids, maybe grandkids, homework, sports, music, lessons, birthday parties, cousins, in-laws. I mean, sometimes you feel like you're barely keeping your head above water. Can I get an amen? amen? I feel the same. I do. Like, how can I do all this? And those things in and of themselves are not necessarily sinful, not necessarily bad things. But when they start to overshadow Jesus in your life, then you've lost what is of first importance. When they keep you from the things of God, prayer, Bible reading, Christian fellowship, service, and worship, then you aren't keeping the main thing the main thing. Well, let me encourage you today, brothers and sisters, as Paul encouraged the Corinthians. He said this, be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. A devil tries to get at us, but stand firm. Be strong. Let all you do be done in love. The grace, uh, that undeserved love that we need. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die, to pay the penalty of death for our sins so that we don't have to spend forever in hell. He experienced hell on the cross for us in our place so that we don't have to. Thank you for raising him from the dead to conquer death, to know that just as he came out of the grave, so will we. We ask you, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit that we respond to this good news and that we live in such a way that we always keep not only at this church, but in our individual lives, we always keep the main thing, the main thing, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord. In his name we pray, amen.